Hey guys, it's Ross over at The Daily Jaws. I hope you're well. In today's video, we've got something really special. We are speaking to award-winning filmmaker Laurent Bouzereau, whose new book about Steven Spielberg, Spielberg, The First Ten Years, is out now. Laurent has produced and directed hundreds of benchmark behind-the-scenes documentaries, including the very first retrospective documentary on the making of Jaws. Laurent is currently directing several films, including an event feature documentary on John Williams for Amblin, Imagine, and Nedland Media. He directed the HBO documentaries Mama's Boy, based on the best-selling memoir by Dustin Lance Black, Natalie Wood, What Remains Behind, Sundance 2020, and the acclaimed Netflix series Five Came Back, with an Emmy-winning narration by Meryl Streep, as well as the De Palma decade coming in the fall of 2024. Bruce and I caught up with Laurent a few weeks ago, and this is one of the best conversations we've ever had. Guys, please give a very warm Daily Jaws welcome to Laurent Bouzereau. Laurent, welcome. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, it's so fun to be talking to you because in this, uh, uh, when, when, when we got on the, the, the Zoom, I was telling you, I'm, I'm just not only honored to be talking to you, but also uh, in awe of how important um, the dialogue about Jaws is not only for, for, for film buffs, but also for next generations. And you guys are bridging, you know, that gap and and doing an incredible job. So I'm I'm very, very happy to be talking to you. Uh, well, well, thank you so much for the kind words. And it is a privilege. As I, as I said before, we press record on the call. I've been a fan of your books for a while. I own a few of them. Um, and obviously Spielberg, the first uh, the first 10 years is now the latest uh, to the edition. However, before we get to the book, we have to talk about Jaws. Tell us about the first time you saw Jaws and what do you remember about that experience? Well, it's an interesting experience because... Um, I grew up in France, and so the film came out later than it did in America. So I knew so much about Jaws before <laughs> before I even had a chance to, to see it. But what happened in France also is the rating system was a lot uh, more strict than it is in America. Um, I'm not sure about uh, the UK, but under 13, you could not see the film even if you were with an adult. So I was I was 13, but I was extremely, uh, a very young 13. <laughs> and my parents said, there's just no way you're going to see that. So I had to wait a bit, but the good news is that in Europe, at least during the time that I grew up um, in the seventies, um, no films came out during the summer at that time because everybody left the country. So they would re-release movies uh, uh, consistently, uh, especially movies like Jaws. So I got to see it very shortly after my 13th birthday. And by then I had read the book. I listened to the album, the music by John Williams, my friend John Williams. You know, not only people wanting to be directors or actors, but people wanting to do special effects mm. and and uh, people wanting to do music and people, uh, the birth of creativity that this movie gave to my generation and potentially other generations is, uh, is it's crazy. So um, I could go on and on about what I love about <laughs> the film, but uh, uh, it's pretty much the same thing that all the fans are listening to, and I'm not going to bore you with that. But it's a, it's a really profound um, uh, appreciation. And I have to tell you, when, when I wrote the book, I challenged myself with two things. First of all, I, I had a lot of discussions with Stephen about 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 the book. And I didn't want to suddenly make uh, a deep dive, <laughs> pun intended, into everything that it took to make the film and mm. how many this and and what day that. It, it was much more, I kind of challenged myself, watch the movie again, and what is it that you've never noticed before? Mm. You know? And it was a lot less about the making of it as much as it was about the thematic of it and what the film today means, not only on a technical level, uh, but also on a thematic level in relation to the first 10 years of Stephen's career. And connecting those dots was absolutely amazing for me as a, 
as a fan because I just realized, you know, there are movies just like there are work, works of art that transcend time and transcend generations and um, can be appreciated on so many different levels um, that it they continue to inspire you and to notice new things. So to me, you know, Jaws is right up there with several other films, very few, um, that will never cease to amaze me and to surprise me, no matter how many times I look at it. Yeah. There, that was such a fantastic answer to that question because there is so much there that we we could unpack, but there's a couple of things I'd love to just just understand a little bit more. So, because for me, I agree that Jaws seems to go through almost like a rebirth every, almost like every decade or something in terms of a new theme being identified or a new aspect of the film. So, for example, uh, particularly here in the UK, obviously we, we had everyone was experiencing COVID. And lockdown, strongly compared to beaches open, beaches closed, and Mayor Vaughan and our very own Boris Johnson at the time. So all of a sudden, Jaws had this new relevance, and people were looking at the movie in a very, very different way. And when I was younger, when I saw it, uh, I was about five or six when I first saw it, I was there like any other kid. Like, the shark was in my mind from minute one, and all I wanted to do was see it and do what it does. you know. And I was in it for the blood, the guts, and the gore, and the action. However, over the years, my relationship with the movie has changed. First of all, through the first three key characters, so Brody, Quint, and Hooper. I wanted to be Hooper. I was fascinated by sharks. I wanted to learn about sharks. Then uh, I sort of became a little bit more like Quint, I think. I became a little bit more cautious and a little bit more isolated as I kind of figured out who I was as you sort of develop and you grow into the person you you end up becoming. And then since being um, a godfather for the last sort of three or four years, I've become much more Brody. I've become much more father figure, duty bound, um, much more aware and and, and uh, caring of other people. Not that I wasn't caring before, but it sort of just intensified through 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 these through these kids and this family that I have. And then you have that political situation, as you say, around lockdown. And all of a sudden, Mayor Vaughan, you start looking at him in a very different way. And all of a sudden you think, Jaws is telling me so many different things in so many different ways you could watch that movie and I uh, we just before we, we sort of press record on the interview, we started to talk a little bit about The Exorcist. And I think you're right. I think there is definitely a, simil uh, a similarity between Jaws and The Exorcist and the way that they continue to play and the way that they don't lose their power. Um, I went to see The Exorcist in London for Halloween. And it was a special Halloween screening because uh, a film critic called Mark Commode, who is, I don't know if you've heard of, you have heard of Mark. Yeah, yeah I, I know he is. Yeah, he's he's a fantastic film critic and he's a yeah. sort of a bona fide um, expert Exorcist. on The Exorcist. Ex yeah, he is Mr. Exorcist and he was there doing a talk about it. So it really helped set the scene. And there was a huge amount of people who stuck their hands up when he asked and said, have you ever seen The Exorcist? And about half of the audience hadn't. And they all came out and we could tell the people that had seen it for the first time and the people that hadn't. And the people that had seen it for the first time were affected by it. And as we said before, when uh, I think it was the year before last, when it was the 3D re-release of Jaws and the IMAX re-release, I went to see the 3D re-release in my local cinema and it was packed full of uh, kids and families and obviously parents of my age bringing their kids. Jaws played exactly the same way for them as it probably did 50 years ago for kids of their age. They were laughing in the right places. They were screaming in the right places. They were cheering when Brody killed the shark. It's just one of those perfect, perfect films. And like you said, it inspired so many other people to get into this industry as well. You know, Greg Nicotero, for example, he's a special effects genius who did the amazing restoration of Bruce the Shark that now is in the in the Los Angeles uh, Museum of Picture Motion Picture Sciences. He was inspired by Jaws to do that, and so many other actors and directors. And it's just an incredible uh, ensemble of craft as well as cast, which leads me finally to my question: <laughs> um, What is your favorite aspect of Jaws? Well, I'll say, I'll uh, before I answer your question, I hope you don't mind. I think mm. Jaws has become a brand in the sense that if you go into a meeting, uh, you, you know, I'm, you know, pitching constantly. If you say something like, well, I have a Jaws-like project, they know exactly what you're talking about, mm. uh, even though it's nearly 50 years old. Um, how many, it's not true for a lot of, movies because you're pitching to super young people right and and if you say oh this is like 
even a movie like Carrie, the Brian De Palma's Carrie, when you say Carrie, a lot of people have not seen it. But Jaws and The Exorcist uh, um, are are right up there. The aspects of the film it really that speak to me really are echoed with what you just said uh, so so well, because at first it was this really micro curiosity about the film. For example, something as simple as like, I don't understand why the lobby cards outside the movie theater show uh, the death of the first victim, Chrissy, and it's in daytime. And in the movie, it's in nighttime. Mm -hmm. And for, for years, I'm just like, I don't understand. Well, did they do a special photo shoot with her <laughs> what what is the theory behind this of course i saw the movie uh, by truffaut day for night and mm -hmm. knew that there was uh, 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 eventually a technique and when i asked Stephen, that was one of the questions that i had never asked Stephen um in my original interview with him 30 years ago, I said to him, I said, why, why did you shoot the movie Day for Night? That whole, uh, you, you know, that attack. And he said, because if it had been night, you wouldn't have seen the horizon. Mm -hmm. And I just love that because it's just so emotional to me to, to, uh, to understand there was a reason behind all those choices. But I, I have to say that um, that fascination with the micro aspect of of the making of the film mm -hmm. uh transformed because one of the first things that david brown who was a producer on the film told me uh when i did my documentary the first of its kind and the thing that's important and i spell it out in the book is that when i did that documentary mm -hmm. they had never talked at length about this film since the film came out also, there was no Wikipedia, there was no, you know, access to information. So I was really uh, scrambling to get information that was accurate. And, mm. and it was difficult because there is such mythology around the making of this film. It's very hard to really get the truth. And the reason why I'm at peace with it is because David Brown told me before we started filming, he said, Laurent, this is... Rashomon, you're going to ask the same question to all of us, and we're all going to give you a complete different take on the exact same event. Mm -hmm. So if you're at peace with this, let's do this interview. If you're not at peace with this, <laughs> you're in the wrong business. <laughs> but uh, I, I moved along and I was at peace with it. The making of the film continues to, to be scrutinized and to be, I mean, there's this play now, The Shark is Broken, you know, that is a whole new take on, on uh, the making of the film or the relationship between the three actors. And, and we know because you read everything about Jaws that Richard Dreyfuss is not completely aligned with his portrayal, right? So looking at the film today for me, that that evolution, I get to, to answering your question, was really about the artist that is mm. Steven Spielberg. Yeah. And I was like, how does this movie connect to the, the first 10 years of his career from, and I include Duel because Duel came out as a movie in theaters in France, um to et how do do because after et it's a new steven you know mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a new uh it's a new era so how do those movies you know connect and and how does jaws connect to those films yeah. and what i discovered it was the notion of home as we know in jaws uh brody is brody has moved from new york to Amity, and and it's not home. It's not home, and there's a threat, which yeah. is the shark. But it's the threat on him creating a new home. Really, there is this really interesting scene where, after the attack in the estuary, where Brody's uh, son is almost uh, killed by the shark. There's a scene in the hospital where uh, uh, Brody says to his wife. Uh, um, 
uh, take the kids home. And his wife says, home here or home New York. And he says, mm -hmm. home here. He makes a full commitment mm -hmm. to home. And of course, when they're on the boat, uh, they're singing about home, the three guys. So the home theme is very potent and very important. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that was echoed throughout all the movies that Stephen made during this period. Mm -hmm. Do All is a Man We Threaten to Never Go Home. Sugar and Express is about a couple trying to come home and recreate their home with their kid. Jaws is a bad home, as we've said. Close Encounters, it's a man who leaves home. 1941 is about an attack on the homeland. And the last image of the film is literally a home sliding down uh, a, a dune uh, by, by the ocean. And then you have Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where you have literally a man who may have a home, but he's never at home. Mm. And you end those 10 years with E.T. phone home. And I said that to Stephen and he looked at me and he's like, I guess I've never been far away from home. <laughs> and I just <laughs> love that about, about his answer because yeah. I felt I had really connected Jaws at that moment as an extremely personal film, mm. as opposed to something that was a blockbuster. I defy young people today who come out of the theater seeing a so-called blockbuster movie who directed it they will yeah. not be able to tell you jaws you will be able to say mm. and that's because it is an intimate personal independent movie that's yeah. what jaws has become for me it, it has had this incredible arc of this giant canvas to a story of the heart and when you look at jaws when you look at all of the promotional campaigns and the posters and everything it's one of the most deceptive marketing campaigns ever because the shark is barely on screen it's firmly in your mind from minute one but actually it's about the characters and that's why i think one of the secrets to the longevity not just of jaws but also of, of a lot of spielberg's work in terms of say the overall career arc that Stephen has had where do you think Jaws kind of sits and 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 what kind of impact do you think it had on him as a, a storyteller you know that's really a question for him but from an audience standpoint I, I think Jaws for me you, you you really see a director who cares about characters and who cares about humanity mm. uh, to bring in the stories of World War II in the middle of the movie uh, uh, you, you know the famous speech by by uh, uh, Quint. That's pretty bold, even at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty bold, and 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 suddenly it's a history lesson in addition to <laughs> to being an adventure story, right? So so uh, I think it announces a lot of his other films where he is interested in. You, you know, humanity and mm. is interested in history and is interested in linking entertainment with uh, stories of the past and mm. history and social commentaries. And by the way, that's not completely conscious, probably, but that's what makes him a humanitarian in addition to being a brilliant filmmaker really is a very unique person we're talking about. Mm. Uh, there's no one else like him in film history and nor mm. would there ever be anyone like him in, in, in history. So to have that story land in his hands at such an early time in his, in, in, in his career, because he's so young, um, is remarkable because yeah. there's a maturity there's a maturity in that movie in terms of the cinematic language, in terms of the pacing, and uh, th th that is timeless. You, you, you know, you watch films of that era and, and you just can't believe that Jaws belongs in that same year as other films that are coming out that are literally not only unwatchable, but 
unless you put back on a very open mind, you mm. you know you 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 just can't believe how long and boring they are, and and how um, badly conceived they are. Um, so so it, it's it's not um, it's not a shoe in, you know, mm. job. It's not a it's not like a, a thing that just oh it it how lucky it worked out. It really is. A, a, a visionary and and something that's very uh, uh, profound, I think. It's great because I think you've really hit on something then. And the through thread, home and hearts, those seem to be the two things that, or, or, or maybe more specifically family. I think they seem to be sort of the two of the key things that they seem to be the through thread through Spielberg's career. But obviously your book focuses on the first 10 years. So how important were those first 10 years for Stephen in terms of his career and, and learning the craft? I mean, he's kind of like a veteran by the time he made Jaws anyway, because he'd made lots of TV stuff and obviously done Jewel and Sugarland Express. But what were those, how important were those first sort of 10 years for, for Stephen? Well, I mean, they show the first 10 years or so, they really lay out who he is in, in so many ways. Um, mm. And again, I'm talking purely from an audience perspective because uh, um, he only can speak how much he was learning at the time and how much it was informing his creativity, if I may, and, and mm. the kind of movies that were offered to him. Because let's remember that Jaws was slated to be, you know, you know a disaster after <laughs> after how long it took to film and 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 the shark not working and all that good stuff that we can laugh about today but i'm sure it was no laughing matter back then and and i i i believe in my book he does talk about you know how scared he was that he he thought his career was over but i think that he he those 10 years really define his thematic which is as you said you know family home incredible characters all of them but also there's a lot of experimentation which is echoed throughout his career there is a sense that dual is one type of so yes dual has you know is a distant cousin from jaws mm. but definitely a playground for jaws but it's two different films, uh, two mm. different scope, two different, I mean, even from a practical standpoint, is not even comparable. Mm. <laughs> Sugar and Express is is literally uh, almost an, an oddity at the beginning of his career because it's almost like a French film. Yes, it's in, you know, widescreen and, and a lot more uh, extras than in a French film, but it's like this little intimate story about, you know, it's almost like Bonnie and Clyde, basically. Mm. Uh, and 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 it's echoing, actually, films of that era. Badlands is another one, you know, where, where filmmakers of his generations, like Terry Malick or Arthur Penn, who is a bit older, but were exploring in... Mm. Uh, in, in in cinema and then, and then you have the spectacle with close encounters which by the way comes out the same year as star wars and mm. both film even though are both science fiction movies they are redefining the genre in a way that shows one type of film with star wars and another type of film with close encounters yeah you know and and that's really remarkable and then of course it does 1941 which reset the clocks for him because it didn't do well i mean it did do well but it was not well received and then of course you know raiders is his love of cinema his love of the b-movie kind of adventure and E.T. is really his most personal film then. But I don't think you get to E.T. without Close Encounters, without yeah. Jaws. It, it, that trajectory is, is almost like a shooting star that is just this perfect, perfect trajectory. Mm. Uh, um, and, and it's extremely moving to, to look at those movies I just mentioned and realize that's the birth of an auteur. It's not the birth of a director. It's the birth of an auteur, of someone with a, a vision, a voice, a style that is just so 
unique to just him. Yeah. And um, lastly, I feel like he is not repeating himself, even though there are similarities between those films. And and as I said, one leads to 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 the next in a kind of interesting way. They're all very singular and they're all challenging him in different ways. He mm. talks in the book about Raiders, where the biggest challenge was to make it for a very small budget or a very reasonable budget uh, because he was coming off of 1941. 1941 mm. for me is the last big special effects for real kind of thing uh, film made in Hollywood. After that, it's a new Hollywood. So mm. It's it's a fascinating uh, decade to to look at and to embrace as as something again very unique and I I think directors of that era and you can mention Friedkin and you can mention Brian De Palma during those ten years really in parallel are all doing with tremendous success or tremendous failure very interesting films. Mm. Now we have to talk about the book because honestly, I, I got the copy, I think it was day before yesterday oh, and I've started to digest it. Honestly, now there is something that I need to show the, the audience. So bear with me one second, because I, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get this in frame. This is a beautiful, massive, huge book. I mean, this is a proper movie cinephile's dream. It really is. The thing is, fans, you're going to need a bigger bookshelf first of all. Um, but also, Laurent, did you have a say in how big this book was going to be? Because visually, it's fantastic. I mean, one of my favourite things is obviously that picture being on the back, because that obviously that's one of the classic Spielberg Jaws photographs. But just the size of this book, I mean, it makes it visually stunning. And it's very, very easy to just read and digest and take in. I mean, did you have a say in that? Or did you just write it and then let the, the publishers kind of just put that together? What What was that? Oh, no, no, there was um, you know, not only me, but Amblin and Stephen himself. It was it mm. was extremely um, well um, thought out and and very big collaboration. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be that heavy, actually. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't know that it was going to be that large. But at some point, I asked them to print it up and and so that we could really get a sense of, yeah, uh, the placement of the images and all that. I have to say, it is not a fun process. It is very tedious. I, you know, the fun process was really, and that's what I hope people will get the book take away is really the interviews with Stephen. That's yeah. that's uh, that's what I wanted to do originally. I've had this privilege of knowing Stephen for thirty years and. And to to get to talk to him, and I've w wanted to share those interviews in writing because in the documentaries they intercut with things, and 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 sometimes you don't get the full effect of what it's like to have a discussion with him. So mm. I always thought that was an interesting thing to do. I didn't want to do any text by me. I I, I almost wanted to remove all the questions. You know, I really wanted to be you know, Stephen in his own words kind of thing. Yeah. And, and and realizing that there's been a lot of, of things written about Stephen and a lot of things written about those specific films. There are individual books about each of those movies that exist, including some that I've created myself, um, that, you know, there was a potentially a need to, to, make it a little more personal and 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 sharing a little bit my my journey and to share in as we were saying at the beginning of this conversation uh my personal observations about about those films today yeah. so i'm proud of that but really what it is and i'm not being falsely modest or anything it's really i, I would want the readers to just read steven's quotes because that's where you really get the sense of the artist that we've been describing and talking about and really get to take away something um uh, from his experiences making those films 
and what it means in, in the broader sense. I find his quotes extremely relatable, mm -hmm. whether you're a filmmaker or you're, you're wanting to do something completely different. There is this sort of universal language that he has about his own journey and connecting um, personal observations and applying them to storytelling that I find extremely um, important um, and something that I don't take for granted and that I hope readers will feel, again, whether or not they're fans or, or um, film buffs or simply somebody who liked the cover and wanted it to be sitting on their <laughs> coffee table, there is something in the book to learn about wisdom and that wisdom comes exclusively from Stephen himself hmm. and that's one of the things that I really I mean as I say I got the book day before yesterday so I've only started to sort of digest it but obviously I went straight to the the Jaws section and the Raiders section uh because those are sort of two of my favorite movies from from that era period um and yeah it's such a it is almost like uh, you can't help but read it in Stephen's voice in a way if you've ever watched an interview with him or whatever and and that really came through because it's so important to understand his view on these things because he doesn't do commentaries on his films you know which i think is something which is actually quite nice because it again leaves the stories and the movies open to interpretation and things like jaws and raiders and so forth particularly in the first 10 years have been observed and dissected and taken apart and you know critiqued to within an inch of their lives and stuff but just to have steven's input but then also balanced with your through your eyes, the view of, of of the man and the work and the impact that that work kind of had. So he talks about the experience and you maybe talk a little bit more about the the personal impact that it, that it had on you. And I think it, it kind of speaks for a lot of people because Spielberg's work, as we sort of said before, is about home and heart and family, things that everybody can relate to. Those things hit, those things hit, they really do, which is why I think Stephen, again, is not just one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, if not the greatest, but he's one of the most consistently great. I can't remember a bad film that he's made. And, and what I love about it is he seems like a very responsible filmmaker as well, in terms of the fact that obviously he's the king of the box office when he was younger, but he realized that there were some really, really important stories that needed to be told. So things like Schindler's List, Munich, The Post, uh, Bridges of Spies, those kind of things as well that we've seen later on. But because he's brought us along with the, with the best of intentions through these big popcorn blockbuster movies, we're really ready to listen and hear what he has to say about these other big, deeply personal topics, not just for him, but for everybody, which I think is, it sets up nicely and it kind of explains maybe where this first 10 years was, was he was trying to take himself through these experiences and talking about, you know, whether it's aliens or sharks or jewels with trucks or whatever it is. As you say, it's all it's all going kind of somewhere, and it, and when you read this, it's like, yeah, this is totally understandable where where Spielberg has kind of ended up and the stories he's he's sort of telling now. So, um, for me personally, I mean, I can't wait to read the rest of it, and some of the photographs in here are fantastic as well. I have no idea where yeah. you found those. I mean, I was looking through this, I'm like, even I haven't seen this before, and I was like, I thought I'd seen everything. Oh, I'm I'm so happy you're saying that because one of the things that was important is that I'm I'm a collector and. Um, I have collected a lot of things from from that era, especially Jaws and other films of mm. of, of that of the seventies, and uh, um, so I had told the publisher that the most important thing for me, as far as the so called iconography of the films that uh, we're talking about, I, I wanted to bring my own collection to to the book. So. Um, those lobby cards for Jaws and Close Encounters, they were actually in my bedroom wall. It, it's not like I had to, to, you know, scout around the world to find that stuff. Yeah. And the fun thing is that it's also connected to my friendship with my best friend from, who is still my, my friend today, who eventually married uh, the, uh, the, the young woman who was at the cash register of the movie theater uh, uh, and and we were best friends and he has contributed to my collection and to this book and his name is Laurent too so we're like practically uh, but he's a year older than me which I never let him forget uh, <laughs> um, and 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 so you know that collection we built together and and I would say, oh, do you have this? Do you have that? And 
and he would get it to me and I would buy it from him. And we, there was like this whole mafia of movie poster in France <laughs> when I was growing up. It was pretty scary. I would have done anything for uh, movie posters. And, and I literally cleaned up uh, uh, the bathrooms of movie theaters to get free posters. Mm. Uh, I would go to this movie theater in in uh, in the Alps in a small town, and and the owner was super nice. But he's I, I would want movie posters, and I said, "Well, here's a broom, and go clean the movie theater." So I would literally be picking up garbage so that I can get a movie poster. Wow. So anyway, it, it, you know, it's funny. Like those are the little personal touches that that make it uh, maybe a little more intimate for me but mm. zero to anybody else <laughs> well but so. this is the thing this is the power of cinema and the power of talking about cinema in these stories uh do you do you have a particular personal favorite image in the book or the one that said it's most important that we should be looking out for wow that's a great question well it would have to be a lobby card from jaws because they were literally uh, the first movie poster I ever bought was The Towering Inferno. And mm -hmm. the first lobby cars I ever bought were Jaws. So they're in the book and they're from the month the movie came out, <laughs> you, you know, in France. So well, it's... the fantasies that those photos, you know, stirred up in me as someone who wanted to be in film very early on it, it just connects to falling in love with an art form and mm. to want to inhabit it in a way that is beyond just the movie itself you know what i mean yeah oh. laurent i could speak to you all day i think the last question that everybody <laughs> needs to know is where I would want to that, but not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where can people buy the book well, hopefully um, in bookstores, uh, Titan Publishing is doing it in England. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen it around in LA. So if you want to uh, support your local bookstores, uh, I, I hope they have a copy or two. And if not, you can definitely go on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and the different um, book sites. Waterstone has it. And Hatchards, I think, uh, in London, my my favorite bookstore in the world is Hatchards. I go there and I literally stay there for hours. Uh, <laughs> and I mean hours. It's so inspiring to me. When I go to London, you know, uh, I love, part of my family by marriage is British. So there's nothing weird between the French and the Brits in my family, <laughs> okay? <laughs> uh, um, but I have to say that, <clears throat> that relationship between the sort of you you know uh, uh, a tactile relationship to a book uh, still exists in in Europe. It doesn't yeah. exist so much in America, and it's a real shame. The, when I moved to LA in the early nineties, uh, there were tons of bookstores everywhere, tons and and specialized bookstores. You know, I would go to. Uh, you know, science fiction, horror books. I mean, it was incredible. None of them exist anymore. None of them. Zero. New York, a little bit better. But, mm. you know, that that culture that you and I grew up in, which was really that tactile relationship yeah. to books, you know, no longer exist. And and it's it's sad. But I, I, I'm proud that I have my... Uh, first edition of, of Jaws, the novel signed by Peter Benchley, who I love so much. You know, mm -hmm. there, there was something we, we talked about, Stephen, of course, but there was so many friendships for me were created from making that documentary. The most important one was Dick Zanuck, who I ended up making a film about. Yes. And the way he passed away after seeing the film. Like mm. literally, that was- It was like maybe a few days or something, wasn't it? I think, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It was the yeah. last movie he saw. So, you know, talk about impact. John Williams, I'm making a film about John right now, mm. you know, produced by Stephen. And, and I mean, I've known John 30 years. And I used to hang out with his music editor, Ken Weinberg, who passed away, unfortunately. But, you know, I, I have lived 
my passion with those people. Um, Peter Benchley, I, I, I interviewed several times. I went to his home. His wife, Wendy, is someone I talked to regularly. I talked to her last night. You, yeah. you, those are, you know, legacy people for me. They're people who uh, um, built, you know, a benchmark uh, something, you know, mm. whether it was through books or through music or through making the film. And and those are important, you, you know, those are people I, I, I knew their names. Uh, uh, I was looking at at their names. For me, they were the stars of of this film uh, at the same level as Robert Shaw and 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 the others. You know, I I was like, oh, Peter Benchley should be, <laughs> you know. And so meeting them was was a plus. And then to have the privilege of having, you know, staying in touch and having this little. Um, what I would call a, a you, you know professional friendships. It's mm. it's uh, it's important, you know, yeah. uh, because m I feel like you, you know, in many ways, you know, you and you doing that is, it's a responsibility to make sure that the great works are not forgotten, mm. and if not for people like you, uh, there may not be that connectivity that exists with the new generations you know um and when you know when we're gone somebody is going to have to pick that up so igniting that passion uh as you do with all of the you know in a very classy way i must say uh oh, and not you know because the fandom sometimes is a little scary to me uh because you can get lost in it in a way that that no longer speak to an art form if that makes mm. sense you know what i mean yes yeah. and and i think the way you guys approach it is um is very classy and very um inspiring which i think is really important you know so thank, thank you. you well well that's really kind of you to say because as i said before we we press record and i was gushing a little bit i've been a fan of yours for a very very long time i've got a few of your books obviously one more now that i'm going to use as a i think you said you could use it as a doorstop i'm going to use it as a bench press i think that's what i'm going to use it as because it's, yeah. it's heavy enough <laughs> um yeah. but it's um again i mean running the daily jaws as you say it, it has become a, a passion and it is a, a responsibility as well because we are um, we're a respected voice now. We're, we're trying to become a little bit more of a respected voice when it comes to shark conservation. We've got some really fantastic experts who advise us and support us and just guide us and sort of help us navigate those waters as well. Because again, Jaws is it's a great movie. It's it's a masterpiece and it delivered one of the all time great, if not the greatest screen directing talents that, that there's ever, ever been and, and likely ever will be. It also introduces to people like John Williams and, you know, possibly the three greatest cast lead actors of, of all time it's still yeah. culturally relevant as we've said you know through various things even as recent as things like you know coronavirus and things like that it became almost like a metaphor for it you know lockdown beaches open beaches closed lockdown or or, or not um but it is the people that you know these stories touch that, that that really are the ones that keep these things alive and like yourself it's through 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 you know facebook pages like mine or books like yours you know we, we work to keep these legacies alive the only difference between you and i is that i don't have spielberg's number in my phone that's the only difference Laron. you know i have to tell you i wanted to to also mention a little bit of a joke there's one line of dialogue that i don't like in the movie oh really <laughs> It, 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 just one thing and it's a purely personal thing is when Lauren Gary asks her son what kind of ice cream he wants. He says coffee. And I'm like, there's no way a kid likes coffee ice cream. It's the most freaking adult, boring <laughs> ice cream in the world. It should be chocolate, chocolate chip, not vanilla, and not coffee. And each time she says coffee, I don't believe it. I'm like, he's lying <laughs> to you, baby. He's lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be the title of our next article the big jaws lie <laughs> there is no way a kid would love coffee ice cream according to and if they're giving <laughs> if they're giving a kid coffee ice cream shame on the parents that's a big deal will the people make wired no wonder he's going in the water 
<laughs> well, people make people make the joke about um, Ellen Brody being one of the worst parents in cinema because there's a bit where it's during the Fourth of July sequence where um, Lorraine Gary sort of spots Brody and she goes, "I've got Sean," and she mouths it, and in the next shot is Sean running off, <laughs> and you're like, "Worst parent of all time." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think there's definitely, but you know, it was a different time. I have to say the seventies, yeah. my parents, I, I would leave uh, on my bike and not come back for 10 hours. And my, my dad would say, where's Laurent? He's fine. He's on his bike. Oh, well, he's not coming back for 10 hours. What the hell is he? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so right. I do understand uh, Ellen a little bit at least she's not having an affair like she is in the book yes you know? so and Hooper is a nice a- guy he's just he's more interested in his pretzels than uh than than Ellen which is which is good um <laughs> Laurent it's it's been it's been so good to speak to you and guys again the reason we're speaking to Laurent isn't just to talk about Jaws movies, but he's also got a brand new book out, Spielberg, The First Ten Years. Honestly, I would advise everybody to get their hands on a copy as quickly as you can. It is absolutely essential reading if you want to learn about Spielberg, the fantastic director behind my favourite movie of all time, Jaws. Uh, Laurent, it's normally customary for me to leave the last word to you. So if you have anything else you'd love to share with the audience before we sign off, now is the time, my friend. Wow. You're with the tough questions. Um, as I said, you know, I'm really excited to be talking to you because it really underlines the fact that this film that changed my life when I was a kid is still having a similar effect on other people. Hmm. And the fact that I've had this journey with the film from being maybe a great film to being a very personal film is showing that the film has not only legs, but it has a heart. Amazing. That's, I can't top that. That's perfect. That's perfect. Guys, (laughs) I need to sign off here because I'm about to cry. Um, Guys, I've been Ross Williams for The Daily Jewel, speaking with Laurent Bouzereau about his new book, Spielberg, The First Ten Years. Uh, As always, I will drink to your legs and I'll bid you a fond farewell and adieu.